uh, the achievements under the first phase of uh, Capital Market Union initiative. So it's quite good to, uh, to have uh, so many initiatives uh, currently on uh, Capital Market Union. So we have the report of uh, AMAFI. We will discuss that uh, later in, uh, in the webinar. Uh, but we also have uh, the chance today to have uh, representatives from um, the main stakeholders around the initiatives. Andrea Beltranello from uh, the cabinet of uh, Vice President Dombrovsky uh, in charge of uh, coordination on capital market union uh, uh, initiative within, uh, within the commission. We will obviously uh, discuss the, uh, the HLF, the high level forum report that was issued uh, uh, at the beginning uh, of June. We will have also the chance to, um, to listen to uh, Stéphanie Yoncourtin, vice chair of uh, ECON uh, within the parliament and a shadow rapporteur of, uh, for the report uh, on the own initiative report of the parliament on capital uh, market uh, union. And uh, we also will, uh, will hear um, Fabrice de Marigny, who chaired the high-level group launched by uh, France, Germany, and, and the Netherlands, uh, whose report was, uh, was presented to um, the uh, ministers and the, uh, and the, and, and the presidency um, in, uh, in October last year. So uh, I leave it to you, maybe uh, Karel, to uh, to present more more globally uh, the context for for this uh, this report and the webinar today. Thank you, Stefan. So um, it's a pleasure to welcome you for this seminar to have a discussion about the issues affecting capital markets integration, but then a specific view was from France and from the French brokers organization Amafi. We accepts were I mean there was an open tender by the a mafia organization about a year ago to which we uh, reacted as, as a think tank. We were asked whether we could make an assessment what would be the impact of Brexit on the places of the financial centers in Europe, but also on liquidity formation in capital markets and other trends in capital markets, and also to advise a mafia what they could do um, as an organization in kind of contributing to this whole capital markets union project. So we did a report for uh, AMAFI, which um, AMAFI then used for its recommendation, which are presented today. And we're very happy, let's say, that we can have a discussion about these recommendations with a well-known group of experts, I think, which will contribute to this debate. So we will, I will, after this, moderate the debate between these four speakers, which you'll see on the screen today. There is a possibility to raise questions and answers for which you can use the question and answers at the bottom of the screen. So I will try to look at the questions and answers at the bottom um, and see what questions come up and then raise them with the different participants. If you have a burning question which you want to raise also with the audience and which you want to raise live, we can do this as well, but then you have to notify it in the Q&A. Um, just to be clear, we accept we are an independent think tank. We did a study entirely independently for AMAFI. AMAFI made recommendations on that basis, but of course, AMAFI did this as a professional association. We are not a professional association, so the recommendations are AMAFI's. They are not ours. We just wanted to give them the contribution, the background material to give to make useful recommendations on the integration of capital markets in uh, Europe. Um, on top of that, I think the seminar comes at a very good moment. Um, of course, we've seen the, this COVID crisis and we've also seen what the Commission is proposing now in the context of the COVID crisis to integrate capital markets. I think the most important element of that is the whole debate around Corona bonds and the Commission probably directly issuing bonds on capital markets, which will be a big driver to capital markets integration in Europe. But we've also seen a few weeks ago the report of the high level group, which was also created before this crisis but which have made a certain series of recommendations on what to do or what will be followed up next by the European Commission in a series of proposals to further integrate uh, capital markets. And of course, there is then the activity also of the European Central Bank and others on Europe's capital markets. So there is certainly a lot to discuss. I see Stéphanie Jan Courtin has arrived. Bonjour, Madame Jan Courtin. We're happy that you can join us um, as a member of ECON of the European Parliament. Um, you probably heard the introduction by Stefan and myself on why we are doing this 
uh, why we did the work which we are presenting, which we are, or say, which our mafia is presenting today. We would be interested to hear your views about how you see it from the ACON perspective, what should be done, could be done to further integrate capital markets. We know that markets, as Stefan was saying a moment ago, I mean, we are still a bit disappointed what has been realized in the first five years of capital markets union and that European capital markets are still very fragmented. So we would like to hear from your perspective how you see these issues from your angle as a member of the European Parliament, member of the Econ Committee, and what you will do um, in the committee to advance these elements. Madame, okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you very well. Okay. Hi, everybody, and uh, sorry for being late. Sorry for that. Thank you uh, very much, Stefan and Carol, for the, the words of, uh, of welcome. Um, I really look forward to an interesting exchange of views uh, with uh, some of the most prominent experts on the CMU. Uh, as I am sure you are aware, um, I am the Renew uh, spokesperson on the CMU in my capacity of uh, shadow rapporteur on the own initiative report on the CMU that the Econ Committee uh, will adopt uh, in early September. Um, we are coming to the end of the discussion on uh, relaunching the uh, CMU agenda, uh, sub may say, finally. Uh, and, and this comes with uh, peculiar challenges for us at the European Parliament. Uh, basically, we are faced with a binary, uh, binary choice. Either uh, we choose to copy and paste what was done previously, or uh, we stay tuned to our mandate, representing the citizens and especially young people, the consumers and the retail savers. Personally, I think uh, the only way we can make an impact for the years to come is by adopting a strong and ambitious stance in this E&E report. Most of the uh, members of the negotiating team, in particular the rapporteur Isabel Benhumea, agree with me on the need for ambition. So I think it's a good start. It's not enough. We'll stay uh, vigilant, but at least we agree on that. On top of that, uh, two major developments happened. You know them by heart. You know uh, these uh, particular events in the past 10 days, and I believe they are game changers for the CMU project. The first one uh, are the, uh, is the uh, UK announcement last Tuesday on the UK's intention to diverge from the EU rulebook for financial services. This is the la latest of a series of uh, wake-up calls. We should stop being naive with the UK and we should adopt a stronger third country doctrine that truly protects our single market. The second um, game changer, let's call it like this, is the white card scandal. We are just at the beginning of what can, we can describe as the new European Emerald scandal, and uh, I'm sure we'll have more developments uh, in, in, uh, in the next weeks. But we have to stay vigilant, and there are multiple aspects to this scandal. In the CMU context, I think two aspects are really fundamental. The first one is we should definitely review our audit regulation to end the dominance of the big four accounting firms. And I already mentioned this topic in the annual uh, competition policy report uh, for which I am rapporteur and which was adopted last week in plenary. Um, with um, uh, 521 votes in favor out of uh, 688 voting MEPs. And this is another wake-up call on the need for uh, more European supervision. Uh, they were repeated to look into the balance sheets of white card and the national supervisor is in charge just decided to look away. Uh, I think a powerful European supervisor um, which can step in when national supervisors fail is definitely uh, only hope to prevent misbehavior, any potential misbehaviors in the future. 
I will be happy to outline in more detail uh, the renewed priorities uh, during the Q&A session, but I wanted to end um, on, a, on a musical note with a question to the next speaker. Uh, dear Andrea, um, I, have, I have heard through the grape wine, like Marvin Gaye said, that the Commission has done most of the content of the CMU action plan. I know and I remember from my past in the Commission that you must be subject to very detailed internal procedure and that the uh, finalization of such an important initiative takes a lot of time. However, I, I would find it very unfortunate that the voice of the Parliament is simply ignored uh, due to procedural questions. So we will be co-legislator on most of the CMU follow-up actions and we should be consulted in advance on an equal footing with the with the member states. So can we commit in this webinar that the Commission will reflect on the European Parliament suggestion and include most of our recommendations in the action plan? Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Unfortunately, Andrea is just out because the Commission network is down. So that is uh, yeah. bad news. Yeah. I mean, I just see it from my colleague. She's trying to make sure that Andrea can call in by phone, but I will certainly remember him of what you said uh, about these three issues, the UK issue, the Wirecard issue, and then the voice of the European Parliament in, um, in the follow-up of the high-level group report and the recommendations. I will make sure we pass on this question to him to uh, uh, ask him to send uh, me a, a, write, a writing commitment on my question. Okay, and a commitment in the writing. I, I, will, I will remind him in a moment. I think he will join any moment. He will join by phone, but we will see it on the screen when he is uh, on. But Beatrice is taking care of it. So I propose that probably we move right away to Fabrice. I mean, Fabrice, you can probably react on what Stephanie was saying, because some of this issue will also interest you. Uh, I think about the Wirecard uh, scandal. You're working for an audit firm. So it would be interesting to have your views on that, because the whole audit sector has been a bit aside of this entire debate and is not really centrally supervised, but I think that is a very important issue. But of course, uh, everybody knows Fabrice. Fabrice was the head of the next CMU group, made the report um, second half of last year, which was presented to the ECOFIN in the month of October on what a group of prominent experts thought could be done for Capital Markets Union. So Fabrice, your views on the report which we have presented, which we have made with uh, Amafi, but also on other issues, as I said, Wirecard, but also possibly on um, the, I mean, what should be done now to create really capital market union. I see Andrea is back, or should we go back to Andrea first, or will you speak first, on, uh, Fabrice? To you. Maybe I, I start to make sure that Andrea stabilizes its network. Exactly. Uh, but thank you very much, uh, and thank you, Stephanie, for this very triggering debate comments, which are uh, extremely positive. Overall, you mentioned several reports that now are published, and I am extremely glad that they all converge in a certain manner, uh, and uh, in, they confirm what we recommended, which was a shift of priorities compared to CMU phase one, which, as you will remember, was devoted to revitalizing the financial sector that was damaged by the crisis, that was uh, re-regulated uh, and was not having the full confidence of the citizens. Uh, and now, because of Brexit, because of change of paradigm uh, in the trade, international trade, uh, and the fact that borders mean something, uh, and the, that globalization is not yet a win-win game as it was previously. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy that the union, be it the parliament, be it uh, the council, is taking seriously the need to create in the EU27 in, uh, a real capital market union. But as we said, the city uh, was an excellent center in a number of issues. We all betted on that, but now it's not anymore in, in the uh, single market and it's even the main competitor of the single market. So it's time to be uh, very tactical, uh, ambitious, 
and create something that is self-sufficient uh, in the union, able to help economies and companies to finance through the markets uh, without external dependencies. So that's ex it's extremely uh, clear now and it's transparent in all reports. And in particular, those objectives that are time now to go to the fundamentals of a market, which is to respond to citizens' needs. Uh, and we know in the pension area, there will be strong needs. Uh, and I'm very glad that all reports converge on that and make clear proposals, uh, which will generate long-term savings. Um, and as we all know, the transition to a sustainable economy will not happen with public money. Uh, you need private money. But private money, uh, it means that you have long-term available capital uh, to do so. And all that must favor that. And it's time for the capital market union to show that it has a purpose uh, for citizens and for companies and for a sustainable economy. You will remember, I'm always saying this, but it's symbolically very important. We even recommended to change the name of the capital market union and call it a saving and sustainable investment union because it means something to citizens to companies and to the next generation and i think this is clearly the key objectives of the new commission so i would not give up on that uh, i think people will citizens will understand why time is committed to this project if they understand well for what what is it for them on it so the name should reflect that the other strategic uh, shift of priorities is through the equity market. I'm very glad to see in all the reports that this is clearly understood, uh, be it private equity or public markets, uh, and how, function, how it functions. Uh, and a number of proposals go into the, that direction. Some are tax issues in countries, some are difficult, but they are now in the list of priorities, which is much welcome. And last, uh, and that's where maybe I, I hope now that the Commission has such a number of information, uh, will use this uh, background material to create a real plan that has a number of synergies with other things. Uh, and I think in particular, uh, supervision and make fragmentation uh, uh, lower or destroy barriers which means creating a, a, a banking and intermediary sector that is extremely competitive, that there is no obstacles to mergers uh, between players across the borders, uh, be it banks, be it exchanges, be it trading platforms, be it post-trading platforms, and other forms of platforms that will integrate the market. Then there is also, I believe there should be now, uh, a real industrial uh, digital finance plan. I think the CMU one was about facilitating innovation, sandboxes, and uh, a more friendly approach to supervision to emerging innovation and disruptive players. But now it's time to move to an industrial policy uh, because the future is this. You, you can see it in payments, in, in the, you will see it in the next day, it's in payments. The ECB is creating pan-European platforms. So let's move now to a real ambitious industrial plan of digital finance. And supervision uh, is an issue, and, and I will come back to, to that immediately. Uh, but we definitely need now to avoid supervisory uh, competition. Uh, I'm not saying regulatory. Regulatory is the single rule book, and it's more or less uh, now uh, the path to achieve that is there. The point is how national supervisors apply this. Uh, and I think we should do everything possible to avoid su supervisory competition. And there are ways to do that and to entrust ESMA, uh, be it directly or through a coordinating role. Uh, or if the market is not sufficiently integrated, it should be the national supervisors. We should do that filter of where supervisory efficiency is at national level or at supranational level, not in a doc doctrinic manner or, uh, but really pragmatic way. Where is the efficiency of supervision? 
Uh, that's what we should ask ourselves for each directive. Now, coming to, uh, I think, last point, the, the CMU will help uh, uh, the recovery plans. First, there will be a huge amount of uh, bond, uh, sovereign bond emission uh, issuances, uh, and then all the questions of the international role of the euro uh, that so far has been quite timid uh, because I think everyone in Europe was waiting that the currency is properly established. And now it's more than 20 years and has survived a number of crises. So I think we should now have a very ambitious policy of making the euro uh, internationally more used in the global markets. All the financial centers that are powerful in the world, they are based on a strong currency. Uh, so we should now uh, be less timid. And the other aspect of helping the recovery plan, I, I read in the Franco-German initiative and, and in the plan of the commission, this intention to create a strategic fund uh, that would invest in equity uh, for strategic sectors. Uh, and that needs two things. First, that the equity markets are extremely efficient uh, and that they are trustful. And there I, I really react to what uh, Stephanie said uh, on Wirecard scandal. How can you imagine that taxpayer money will be invested through a fund in equity in strategic sectors, which are such an important uh, for the future generations and for the sovereignty of the union uh, without having full confidence on what you invest? Uh, I think that all that is extremely connected. And indeed, the audit market uh, for major companies is made of significant, I, I put it this way, dominant players. Uh, and uh, diversity, it can be created uh, very easily, actually. Uh, there are successful experiences. Uh, in France, for example, joint audit has helped the emergence uh, of new players. So um, I think it's, there is a revision clause in the audit regulation, but that revision should be ambitious. And I welcome indeed uh, the report on EU competition policy that was adopted by the parliament last week, calling for uh, the commission to thoroughly uh, study uh, the, this market and make proposals uh, to make it more diverse through joint audit, for example, uh, but definitely uh, trust in the market is fundamental. And, and in particular, if you start using public money to invest in equity markets, uh, it's of utmost importance because without confidence, a market simply does not exist. Okay, thank you, Fabrice. There was already a question for you in the meantime, just before you answer that last point about Wirecard, about the audit uh, scandal. How do you respond to this? But in the meantime, you have already responded. Andrea, um, I don't think you have heard what Jan Courtin said, um, the MEP. There were three points he basically said. First of all, the UK. The UK has started to diverge and has announced its intention to diverge. So it's very clear that we have to have defend the single market versus in the Brexit negotiation, so to say. Second thing was related to the Wirecard scandal. She said, we need to review the audit regulation. And um, uh, finally, she said that the voice of European Parliament in the follow-up of the CMU and of the high-level group report has to be heard. So, Andrea, we listen to you, what the plans are of the European Commission in the follow-up of the high-level group report, how you want to take it on. We have seen this list of 14 recommendations, or 17 recommendations, of lots of work basically from the second half of this year onwards. But also please uh, feel free to co comment on the recommendations from what Amafi has proposed in this debate on how we should further integrate capital markets. Andrea. Thank you, Carol. Good morning, everybody. And I'm sorry that I could not listen to all what the panelists said. I was 
kicked out of the meeting for a few minutes by the commission's network. Uh, so this is uh, unfortunately what happens in the era of virtual meetings. But I think I could hear uh, most of what was said and thanks also to you for uh, summarizing it so, um, so effectively. Um, yes, indeed, uh, we see that Capital Markets Union remains a very important priority for the commission. It has been a priority, as you know, for a long time. And here I have to say that I must disagree with uh, what I heard uh, already from the panelists and what also I've been hearing from others, that the first uh, commission action plan of Capital Markets Union did not achieve much, uh, that has not been a success. Well, I think uh, this is not true. Um, in fact, if you look at the uh, 13 legislative proposals that the commission put on the table in the last mandate, 12 have already been politically agreed by the co-legislators or are already adopted. And uh, it's also true that it's not all about legislation. The commission and then the parliament and the council can provide the legislative tools, but then it's also up to market participants to make use of those tools or securitization of cover bonds of investment funds. It's up to national authorities as well to make sure that this legislation is implemented and enforced effectively. So I think it's important to stress that CMU is a collective effort and that in the first iteration of the action plan, we have already uh, uh, laid down uh, all the building blocks, uh, but we agree uh, clearly that we need to do more. We agree that we need to raise the level of ambition. This is why uh, Executive Vice President Dombrowski has decided to launch uh, the high level forum on CMU. Um, and it's even more relevant now uh, in the recovery phase. And I think this was also very clear uh, in the Commission work program, in the revised Commission work program that the Commission adopted together with the recovery plan, where Capital Markets Union uh, feature uh, very prominently because uh, private money will be essential for the recovery. It will be particularly important for companies, uh, which during the uh, crisis now, in the acute moment of the crisis, have built up uh, a lot of debt, which is normal because bank lending is the most efficient way to get uh, immediate liquidity to companies that simply need to stay afloat. But it's also clear that in the aftermath of the crisis and in the recovery, we need to rebalance the debt equity ratios. We need to get more long-term capital to ensure that companies can stay solvent for the long term. We need to recapitalize and Capital Markets Union is an important tool, even more relevant uh, than ever then. And it's not only about companies. And I think that the, uh, uh, all the reports that we've seen, not just the high level forum report, but also the report of the next CMU high level group and others show very clearly that we need also to have the trust and the confidence of retail investors to invest in capital markets. Uh, and it's in their interest. And we need to be sure that we have that confidence so that they can also participate uh, in the opportunities offered uh, by the recovery. So I think uh, one uh, important aspect uh, is that all uh, the reports that we have seen, not just the high level forum report, but all the reports that have been produced on CMU, they may diverge on some things, they may put more priority, more focus on some elements relative to the others. But I think it's very clear that they all converge on the priorities and they all converge on uh, the tools, broadly the tools that we need in order to make of Capital Markets Union a success. And I think, that's very comforting for the Commission. That's reassuring to see that there is a broad uh, support on that. Um, we also need broad support at highest political level, both uh, in the European, in the Council, so member states, and I said also European Council indeed, because we need, need this broad support also from, uh, uh, from the highest, uh, the top level in the member states, and also uh, with the Parliament. And of course, uh, we, we are uh, very uh, eager and happy to work with uh, the, the European Parliament Parliament and the Econ Committee in particular in the next years to uh, bring forward uh, uh, these initiatives. We also need Capital Markets Union to meet our uh, big challenges, uh, digitalization uh, and digital transformation uh, in the financial sector, but not only. 
and uh, of course uh, the climate change uh, transition challenge because we see that uh, the amounts that we will need to meet these challenges are actually increasing as you know, the Commission is now assessing uh, how to raise our 2030 emission reduction targets between 50 and 55 percent cuts. And this will need, mean that we'll need even more than the 260 billion yearly additional investment uh, that we had uh, envisaged. And clearly, we cannot do that only with public money. The contribution of uh, private money uh, will be uh, essential for that. Um, I also heard some references uh, to uh, the wire. Um, uh, scandal, uh, the Wirecard case, and uh, what uh, kind of you know what kind of lessons we can draw uh, from that uh, situation. Well, it's clear that it's very important that we have uh, a strong regulation and supervision because, as I was saying before, this is fundamental for preserving trust in finance, and this has to apply both for traditional players and for new play players. So that's really important for transparency. It's it's important for investor and consumer protection and also to ensure financial stability because it can also get to that level. And this, uh, the executive vice president Ambroskis has made it very clear that uh, he uh, wants to understand what has uh, uh, happened in this case. Uh, in fact, uh, the commission services have sent a letter to ESMA uh, to invite ESMA to carry out a fact-finding analysis of the events that led to the collapse of Wirecard and of the supervisory response to these events. So at this stage, this preliminary analysis would, uh, should seek to establish uh, uh, what happened. So uh, a description of the events and an assessment of the events because there are many ramifications and we need to understand them very carefully. And also we need to understand the adequacy of the supervisory response to these events that led to the collapse of Wirecard. So we will continue to follow very closely this case. It's about audit, but it's not only about audit. It's more generally about capital market regulation. It's about transparency to uh, the market because Wirecard uh, uh, was a listed companies. But aud in, on audit uh, specifically, since I understand that this point was made in particular, in, indeed, as uh, uh, Fabrice was saying, uh, we have a, a review coming of the statutory audit directive. And this was in the cards before uh, the Wirecard uh, case. Here, uh, we, uh, uh, we will soon launch a study to assess uh, the effectiveness of our legislation in the statutory audits market, because we do see uh, that uh, there may be uh, still some shortcomings there. So we want to evaluate the impact of the uh, audit directive on the market. And these results should become available already next year. Okay. Regarding the market structure uh, uh, in the audit market, we are going to publish in the second half of this year, our second uh, market monitoring report. And this is based on contribution for national competent authority. But I think it's fair to say that, uh, uh, that the high level of concentration of statutory audit market certainly give rise to uh, some concerns and we need to look into those uh, very, uh, very closely. Maybe uh, I will stop here, uh, Carol, because I spoke already a lot, but I'm, of course, happy to answer any questions uh, there may be. Uh, maybe just to uh, find one final point, uh, <laughs> a very important point on the next steps, because today uh, we are uh, closing the feedback period that we opened for the, uh, on the high level forum. Uh, report because for us, of course, it's very important also to get uh, feedback from a broader uh, range of stakeholders. And we, we are uh, soon uh, starting to prepare uh, the action plan that we uh, want to adopt uh, in the early autumn. Uh, so I would say around September. Um, and here I, I stop and uh, I, leave, I give the floor back to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um... Andrea, could I ask you one brief follow-up question because uh, Madame Jon Courtin said also something about uh, the voice of the European Parliament and she has uh, the impression that the voice of the European Parliament is not heard and she, and she says, let's say, the different proposals which uh, will be on the table are full co-decision proposals. I mean, is there something specific uh, that you say that this is uh, overdone or say this is um, not right that she's saying this? No, uh, I don't think so. I think it's uh, perfectly legitimate and it's perfectly right because for us it's always been uh, absolutely key that we have both co-legislators uh, on board. 
Um, and uh, indeed, uh, in the area of financial services, at least uh, uh, all um, the uh, policy areas on which make proposals are uh, involving co-decisions. Uh, so uh, Parliament and Council being on a, a equal footing, that is true for Capital Markets Union, but it's also true for sustainable finance. It is also true for digital finance. Of course, there are some areas, and we saw, we've seen this already in the previous action plan, uh, which are not, uh, let's say, in the financial services area stricto sensu, but uh, they are more, uh, uh, let's say, framework conditions that are very relevant for capital markets development. And I'm uh, talking about insolvency, I'm talking about taxation. And for example, when it comes to insolvent, uh, to taxation, sorry, we know that there, uh, the, uh, the legislative pr uh, procedure is uh, with the council and it is uh, uh, unfortunately on unanimity. So it's also very difficult in that respect to uh, make progress there, but it's, uh, this is how the institutional uh, setup uh, is, is done. This is how the treaties are. Um, but uh, it, apart from that specific case, uh, of course, there is full commitment from the side of the European Commission. And I know personally from Executive Vice President Dombrovskis to uh, keep the parliament fully on an equal footing uh, in this uh, in this process of pushing forward capital markets union thank you very much for this uh, response to the question we can probably come back to that afterwards uh, madame john cortin let's say but we will first pass the floor to stefan on the report which amafi is releasing today on the recommendations on what should be done to further capital markets integration in europe what are the effects of uh, britain leaving and and the city of london leaving the eu what is the effect on um, kind of integration of capital markets on the new places which will emerge, Stefan? Yes, um, well, thank you, Karel. And I, I would like uh, also to thank um, Stephanie, Fabrice and, and Andrea for, for, for what they said. Uh, they, they said much uh, already on um, the, um, the global framework for, uh, for the relaunch of the CMU initiative. And much uh, was uh, music to my, uh, to my ears. Um, the first thing is, I, 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 I think that Fabrice is totally right when he says that we need to ensure that there is enough communication um, on the, uh, the reason why it's important to, uh, to relaunch uh, capital market union. It's not just about capital markets. Um, it's important to, uh, to make sure that uh, it is well understood that first capital market union uh, will be, uh, uh, will be uh, needed and uh, indispensable to, um, uh, for, for, for the uh, European uh, Union's economy recovery. Uh, we, have, uh, we are facing uh, a, a crisis that is unprecedented. Um, as underlined by Andrea, it was quite logical that the first phase of the answer was to, um, uh, to provide loans to, uh, to companies just to, uh, to keep them uh, alive. But it also means that we are going to face a situation where the, uh, the unbalance uh, within certain companies uh, between debt and capital will be even worse. So we need to ensure that we have the tools to uh, restore uh, the uh, debt to equity um, ratio uh, within companies. And that's true for big companies, but that's also true for, uh, for small companies. And capital market union is key from, uh, from, that, stand, uh, from that standpoint. To, to, to get there, we need more investors. We also need tools to convert uh, debt into, uh, into equities. We need intermediaries to, uh, to work on, uh, on these tools. The second stake uh, where uh, we need capital market union and we need to ensure that it is a clear message that is being sent to European citizens is the fact that capital market union is key in terms of financing um, the mitigation of uh, the actions required to mitigate the climate change uh, in Europe. Um, we, as, as Andrea said, we, uh, we, we need uh, very significant investment there. Uh, we need long-term projects, infrastructure projects. This cannot be done through uh, bank financing. 
And uh, so we need to complement that with uh, strong capital market uh, solutions. The third, um, the third stake uh, that we need to answer and where again capital market union is key is about uh, digital revolution and the adaptation of the European economy to, uh, to that new context. We need at some stage as Europeans to be, um, to, 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 to be part of that revolution. It's really the fourth industrial revolution that we are facing collectively. And we need to be, uh, to, to be part of it. We cannot afford simply to, uh, uh, to be left aside. Uh, we already, to be, to be, to be honest, we already uh, missed uh, the third uh, industrial revolution. We cannot afford to uh, not to be part of that one. And again, we really need financing solutions and capital markets union will be, uh, will be uh, key uh, in, that, uh, in that area. The fourth stake is uh, about uh, the edging the of, uh, of populations. Um, this will have an impact uh, on our societies. We need to make sure that we keep the, uh, the system, uh, the performance of the system, we need to keep our uh, uh, retirement system alive. Uh, so it's not about um, getting rid of the pay-as-you-go systems that currently are at the core of the uh, retirement systems for uh, many countries in Europe, but we need to complement that with, uh, with pension funds. It will, uh, make, it will be key to ensure that we keep our uh, systems uh, live and performant. And on the other end, it will provide uh, more, um, more investment for long-term projects that we uh, desperately uh, need. What is at stake also with Capital Market Union is the ability to ensure that we have European champions and we need to develop and to foster the development of European champions in many domains. Obviously, uh, energy uh, transition is uh, one of the domains. Um, digital uh, transition is one of the domains, but also in the financial sphere, uh, we do need to have uh, European uh, champions. The last stake and not the least uh, that we face and where Capital Market Union has to, to, to bring answers is obviously Brexit. For years, uh, the financial community, the European financial community, uh, has been built um, on the uh, supremacy of London, of the preeminence of London as uh, the main financial marketplace in Europe. Um, and these presented uh, quite significant advantages um, that we cannot afford. Uh, to have uh, to have that situation uh, any longer post Brexit, or the more as as underlined by uh, Stephanie Yoncortin, uh, the UK authorities do not do not hide their, uh, that uh, they, they they are willing to um, to uh, to move forward in terms of divergence, and that's quite legitimate from that standpoint. Uh, they need to be uh, to be competitive. We cannot be naive. Uh, as uh, rightly pointed out by, um, by Stephanie. Uh, we need to ensure that we have a, 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 a reasonable level of protection for, uh, for the European markets and we need to foster the development of capital markets within the Union. It does raise a certain number of issues that we did not have uh, uh, under the uh, preeminence of London. So how can you uh, manage to have an integrated market when uh, instead of being concentrated in one single place when, with uh, a single uh, uh, jurisdiction, with uh, a single um, language, you know that you're moving towards a multi-local multi multi uh, model uh, with uh, different um, legal uh, frameworks, with uh, different languages and so on and so forth. That's what um, CMU is, uh, is all about. And from that standpoint, there are a certain number of recommendations in, uh, in MFE report that are also uh, present uh, at uh, some level uh, within the, uh, the other reports that were mentioned, the HLG, so the next CMU report, um, the HLF report, and the soon to be published uh, uh, own initiative report of the, of the, of the parliament. 
obviously um, supervision uh, and, and the consistency and, and unification of supervision will be one of these uh, recommendations. Um, you cannot imagine uh, the US uh, market without a single um, supervisor. We also have recommendations on the need to relaunch uh, securitization. That's, uh, that's obvious. We have recommendations also on the need to, um, to have some flexibility, basically some sovereignty in uh, the uh, transposition of a certain number of inter international standards and especially in the prudential field where we are quite uh, um, concerned with the fact that um, what is foreseen is a very strong impact of uh, the uh, transposition of the fully phasing uh, Basel III package on European entities uh, compared with uh, their uh, international competitors. So these are parts of our uh, recommendation. There are many others in our report and uh, in, uh, in the report from uh, uh, the other uh, stakeholders. What is key is uh, that uh, there is uh, a good level already uh, expressed in those reports between the college status because um, we cannot afford uh, to, um, to wait for years to build a, a consensus. We need to move forward on a certain number of issues. There are some issues where so far, let's say the political uh, consensus is still to be built. I'm thinking here of supervision. Uh, I could also mention, for instance, the creation of a European safe asset that is much needed, much required. It is complex. Um, we have the opportunity to move forward uh, with the current crisis. We all know that uh, European construction has been a construction in crisis times. What, what is happening, what has been happening for, for, for the last month is quite unfortunate. Uh, obviously, we need to make it an opportunity to move forward uh, in terms of uh, uh, building capital markets union. Thank you, Stefan. So you can consult the report on AMAFI's website. Uh, there are plenty of recommendations in there, and I think uh, it covers a broad degree of issues. I'm happy that you addressed this issue of European safe assets, Stefan, at the end, which I think is very important. This issue also of international standards and then many other elements. Um, we have about already two questions. We have about 82 participants so who are following this debate. So if I could invite you all to raise questions, you can do this also in the chat box, but you better do it in the Q&A box. So there are already two specific questions, but if I could first ask the panel members, probably to start with Stephanie, whether there are any elements you would directly like to react upon. We have about 25 minutes left in our webinar. Stephanie? Yeah, thank you very much, Gary. Uh, first, thank you uh, to all of my predecessors for their very interesting uh, um, points. Uh, thank you, Andreas. Uh, and thank you, Andrea, for mentioning that the European Parliament will be placed on equal footing with the other uh, institutions. I, I don't know whether you, um, uh, you, you heard my question uh, at the end of my uh, intervention. So uh, uh, if I may just ask you um, an oral commitment, but then we can also ask and request a written one, but I don't think it will be necessary. I just wanted to know that, and so I'm glad that uh, the European Parliament will have its say. I, I just wanted to know that um, whether you can now uh, commit that the, the Commission will reflect and take on board on, on the uh, European Parliament suggestion and include most of our recommendations in, in the action plan. That is a question to Andrea. And I just also wanted to uh, echo uh, what uh, Stefan said on the European champions. And I'm glad to hear that. that uh, and, and, I, and I also share your views, Stefan, that we definitely have to insist on the priority, the key priority to have and promote European champions. Let me uh, just tell you that uh, uh, this is what I hardly fighted for uh, in my uh, competition report adopted in plenary last week. Uh, and I must admit it wasn't that easy. Uh, and it's, it may be um, uh, just playing with words, but you will realize that in my report it's not the word champions that uh, 
we underlined, but leaders. And uh, with that in mind, we managed to have a consensus, which was very hard. And uh, it wasn't easy, you know, following mostly the, uh, uh, you may recall the Siemens Alstom saga. Many of my uh, colleagues, MEP, just thought that uh, uh, behind European champions, we would have just national um, uh, players from Germany and France and that we should avoid that. So, uh, you know, I just wanted to echo on what you say, Stefan, and I, and I do share your view on that. Um, th there is also a, a more broadly a, a question I'd like to, to ask to, my, to the, the other speakers is, you know, um, in my mandate um, as a as an as a MEP, I really put at the heart of it the link between the European, the national and the local levels. And I have to admit, uh, it is often challenging uh, to build enthusiasm uh, for the CMU project, to promote, to raise awareness, because we, you speak about young generation, about uh, retail investors, about people, about citizens. We represent them, but how can we, you know, push for that enthusiasm because I understand we need some rules, some tools, a toolkit, some um, swift measures, some more efficient and, 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 uh, and dynamic, uh, let's say, uh, to push for a more dynamic uh, framework. But uh, what if we um, question the, um, the notion of enthusiasm and which is, uh, you know, um, much more than technical and you know we, we have to uh, kind of uh, um, try to, um, to to overcome the, uh, the, the 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 acronism we face and and and, and Fabrice uh, definitely raised the the, the the good question in renaming somehow the CMU so what does the commission and other players not only the commission intend to do to build uh, enthusiasm especially for a young generation of Europeans, because it's not time to raise awareness of the necessity to uh, build the CMU, but beyond the tools, what if, wh what kind of uh, political enthusiasm and strategy we can pass on this generation and people? Um, and, um, well, um, you know, so, so I'll, I'll, could I ask each of you maybe uh, to uh, give one specific idea on that, uh, not slogans, one idea that citizens can relate to and you can feel appropriate for themselves to better understand CMU and to better, um, to be more familiar with that because that is the real trouble. Beyond the tools, beyond the rules, what kind of uh, uh, spirit uh, we can push for to uh, make people be more aware and familiar and users of capital market. Thank you, um, Stefanie. That's a very clear question, which was also addressed, as you said, by Fabrice. Let's say this issue of the name of CMU, but how can we bring it closer to citizens? Uh, very important. Also, a citizen hardly knows what a capital market is and how can you explain this. So that's a question to probably to Andrea to respond first, but also Andrea said he wanted to add something on the whole debate about Brexit. And there was a question related to Brexit in our uh, Q&A. Uh, specifically, Andrea, the question was, what will the EU do in the context of CMU to facilitate EU domiciled market infrastructures to emerge because we depend on UK-based infrastructures today like ICE, LME, uh, LCH, and what could be done in that context also to facilitate or to advance the use of the euro. So you take probably these two questions, the question from Stefanie, or comments on the other uh, participants, and the question about CMU, and this question specifically about infrastructures. Andrea. Yes, thank you, Karel. Uh, we'll try to be very brief. Uh, indeed, I wanted to briefly uh, come back on Brexit and I'm um, happy also to answer this question. Well, as you know, uh, our objective is to strike the right balance between having uh, deep integrated capital markets in the EU27 while staying open for 
um, international cooperation and obviously uh, regulatory dialogue because capital markets are by nature uh, global. So we need also for uh, the benefit to, uh, of our companies, companies in the real economy, to be able to access the best services uh, at the uh, most efficient uh, cost for them uh, to operate on their daily activities. This is not something abstract, it's something really concerning the competitiveness of our companies. But it's it's clear uh, that uh, the uh, system by which we mostly deal with third country jurisdictions in their financial services is a system of equivalence. And as you know, equivalence is an autonomous decision of the EU. Um, so we, uh, it's very clear that we will base our relations with the United Kingdom on that system. And as you know, we have a best endeavor to finalize equivalence assessments, not decisions, but assessment by basically today, because we said in the political declaration by end of June. We have done our part. Uh, the commission has sent 28 questionnaires to uh, the UK authorities uh, to carry out these equivalence assessments. And so far we've got back four of these 28. In addition, as uh, Stephanie was mentioning, uh, the UK has made some announcements recently, and it's very important for us to evaluate those announcements on the intention of the UK to diverge, which again, I mean, again it's very legitimate because, I mean, uh, uh, Brexit was about taking back control. So uh, we need to assess what that means for our equivalence assessments, because uh, clearly, Equivalence doesn't mean that rules have to be copy and pasted uh, from one jurisdiction to the other, but we need to uh, be uh, have the comfort that outcomes, regulatory and supervisory outcomes are indeed equivalent. And this means that our equivalence assessments have to continue. They have to be forward looking because we are starting now from the same uh, rules and there will be a divergence. So it's a very different situation equivalence assessment with other third countries because there we are starting from a diverging position and we see how we can converge. Um, having said that, as I, I mentioned before, we also need to uh, build our own uh, uh, capital market infrastructure. This is important also to have a strong uh, role of the euro and of the euro area uh, on the global stage. Um, and uh, these have to be uh, done gradually, I think, and this is something that uh, maybe Stefan you can also relate to because I think this is something that was also highlighted very well in your report, uh, Amafi and the SEPS report. Um, so we cannot uh, uh, think that we uh, will reduce our dependence on uh, London capital market infrastructure and they're clearly, for example, from one day or the other, uh, but it will be a question of rebalancing and that rebalancing has to uh, happen. Um, then maybe also to react on a, a couple of things that uh, Stephanie said. Uh, first of all, I think if you look also at uh, CMU so far, uh, Parliament uh, and Commission have been uh, often very much aligned when it comes to promoting access to funding for small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, when it comes to uh, finding the right balance uh, on promoting uh, capital markets while pr uh, protecting investors. When it comes to having stronger uh, capital market supervision, I think all of this, uh, in all of this area, the uh, Commission and Parliament uh, have uh, uh, often seen eye to eye. Um, not to speak about uh, sustainable finance, uh, where Parliament has been a great ally of the Commission in adopting the taxonomy, disclosures, uh, benchmarks. So I'm, I'm really confident that uh, our priorities will continue to be aligned. Of course, we also need to see uh, what is now uh, politically feasible, because clearly we need both co-legislators uh, to agree. Uh, and uh, for example, when we talk about supervision, which I know is an area that uh, um, uh, Fabrice's report and also uh, your report that we are presenting today have highlighted very strongly indeed, and you know how ambitious was the Commission proposal for the review of the European Supervisory Authorities, and we definitely agreed that the result was underwhelming. Uh, now we have to see what's the best way to take that forward. Um, and then maybe uh, very quickly, another point uh, from Stephanie, I fully agree. CMU, uh, unfortunately, is often presented as a very technocratic project. We need to explain better to citizens why it is relevant for them. Um, we need to do it in very simple terms. 
if you are a young entrepreneur out of university with a brilliant idea, you want to launch that idea, you can and not find the funding because you go to the bank and the bank tells you, sorry, but you don't have anything to show for in terms of collateral. That's what CMU can make a difference for you if we develop alternative sources of funding. If you are um, a, a, a person who's saving for her or his retirement, uh, how can you get the best uh, deal uh, and uh, which basically gives you good performance with low costs and in a very transparent way? This is what Capital Markets Union you know, can do for you. Uh, local capital markets indeed we are always speaking about deep uh, integrated capital markets but it's not just about the big financial uh, uh, centers it's also about providing services basic capital market services to uh, companies uh, uh, micro companies that may be uh, in the you know in a in a, in a small uh, market and that does not have a very developed uh, marketing infrastructure. So these are all things that we also need to take into account when uh, continuing our work on CMU. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. You were very complete in your uh, responses to, uh, I mean, what the general comments, but also to what Stefanie said. Um, I have some further questions, but um, I can probably questions addressed to all the speakers about another element of infrastructure, which is data. Somebody said data is the new oil, um, but can we go on living in a world where we say that these data are so important but that the data are controlled mostly by non-EU based companies and also this is the case also for ESG data for example where the data providers um, are basically controlled by non-EU players. Um, and then there is also a question related to the cost of data, the cost of these data also for example in the context Andrea of sustainable finance um, is the cost of data not an impediment to a proper functioning of Europe's capital markets? Probably I will mention that question first to Stefan, who is from a market op operator, a big market operator, a Société Générale. Um, how you look at this, Stefan, from your perspective? Well, yes, data is definitely a, a, a very important um, issue for, for um, the financial industry and more globally for the European economy uh, in the future. On the, on the, financial, um, on the financial side, um, there is indeed an issue in terms of uh, the cost of data and uh, especially market data. This is an issue that uh, has been uh, raised for some time now. Um, the European uh, regulation so far has not been fully effective in uh, solving that issue and we hope that in the frame especially of the, of the revision of uh, mix to me fear we'll get more, uh, more effective solutions uh, on that. More globally speaking, uh, the question of data, uh, we know that uh, the economy of the future will be based on data and uh, you are right in saying that there is an issue in having uh, the masters of data uh, being uh, uh, non-European companies. Here again, we need not to be naive. So we need to protect our data. We need to ensure that there is reciprocity when data is being shared. Uh, and secondly, we need to have European champions for, uh, for the use of data. So uh, it's important to, uh, to move forward in that domain, to build a data-based economy. We have no choice, but we need to ensure that building that economy does not mean that we become more and more dependent on uh, very concentrated actors, very concentrated players that are regulated and based outside of the union. So it's, it's really something where it's a question of will, it's a question of political will, um, it may mean that we introduce in some aspects a certain level of fragmentation. Fragmentation is never something we are looking for because uh, it is costful. But on the other end, uh, we need to protect at some stage our, uh, our market because it's an issue of sovereignty for, uh, for the European Union. And then I would like also to react on, on the question raised by, uh, by uh, Stephanie. I quite, uh, it, it's quite right. Um, the question of how do we, can we build the enthusiasm 
of European citizens around CMU. I tend to believe that, unfortunately, when it comes to uh, the actions of um, the European authorities and European Polish states in terms of setting uh, directives and regulations, most often it's, uh, um, it's used uh, as, as a caricature um, by uh, local uh, national um, players um, and, and this should be avoided and the best way I think to avoid that would be for uh, the commission to communicate directly with citizens um, for instance through TV sports explaining uh, what is being done explaining what is the purpose behind so as to make sure that citizens understand that the European Union is not uh, just a bureaucratic entity uh, setting uh, rules uh, with no uh, clear positive impact uh, for them. It's important to communicate um, and, and just to ensure that the European Commission becomes and the European authorities become um, neighbors to uh, each European citizen and that each European citizen can understand uh, what is being done for him or for her uh, by European authorities. Okay, thank you, Stefan. I turn to Fabrice uh, quickly because there are some questions also addressed to Fabrice. But Fabrice, was another question which you probably could um, respond to, which is basically addressed to Andrea, but you have also dealt with this in your report, which has to do with employee ownership in the EU. What can be done? Share ownership by employees, what can be done for that? But also you can probably respond on the question about pension fund and the needs of more funded pension plans, which was also addressed by several of the speakers, uh, Fabrice. Yes, uh, very happy to do so. I think the common theme of these two questions, it's about creating long-term savings and investments in equity. I think employees uh, schemes are very important because they both uh, they, they have three good reasons to do so. The first one is that it's a product that the employee itself can invest in. The second is that for the company, it creates more uh, stability of the capital and, um, and sense of ownership by the employee of uh, the performance of the company. Uh, and last but not least, it also helps to get out of a debate which is very unproductive, which is our ah, dividends is for rich people and employees are losing money uh, in favor of rich people having dividends. The fact that employees have dividends will square the circle and create more sense of contribution to the growth of the company and better sharing of the profits. So I'm deeply in favor of equity ownership by employees. And in, in the EU, there are ways of doing it through the usage directive, which are quite complex and there is a need of real clarity, uh, especially if we are to promote EU leaders, more than champions across borders, and therefore employees all around Europe, and they should benefit the same way, these employees, whatever they are, uh, of the growth of uh, a pan-European leader in, in every sector. Uh, as regards to pensions, I, I believe this is an, uh, a political issue by member states, but at least they should have uh, a policy uh, supervised by the EU, or at least oversight by the EU, that at least they have a pillar one, pillar two, pillar three policy that will respond to the needs of the citizens. Then how much is pillar one, how much is pillar two, how much is pillar three is a choice, it's a social and political choice, but at least make sure that it happens uh, and that could be checked in the EU semester. And just to conclude, I think there is a, a misunderstanding here, which I would like to avoid. I personally never said uh, that the first phase of the CMU was not a success. I think it was a success, uh, but it has a focus and the focus was to revitalize the sector. And I think it has achieved that. Now, the second phase, it's the, the landscape, the priorities, the mindset uh, has changed. Therefore, the priorities are different. It's not a question of uh, 
uh, failure or not failure. It's simply the context has significantly changed with Brexit, with COVID, with the need of recovery uh, and all that. That means that the priorities are different. And uh, the fact that uh, people need to understand more what Europe does, uh, so that's, you know, my proposal. I think uh, savings speaks to the generation that is about to retire. Sustainable speaks to the next generation and investment speaks to investors. So if you have these three words in your name, at least they will understand what it means. Okay, thank you Fabrice. We go back quickly to Stephanie and to Andrea about this issue of, of share ownership by employees. But if you could also address the question probably Stephanie, because you focused on users, about fees, because there are many people who often say you have more pension funds or of these ownership schemes, there's a huge cost to that. And we have, you don't have a competitive market into that, but also probably Andrea could respond to this. Stephanie or Andrea, who wants to take it first? Because we'll need to stop in uh, a few minutes. Stephanie? Yeah, well, Andrea, if you want to um, reply first, I'm, I'd be happy to uh, have your views on that. Yes, uh, of course. Uh, okay, so on employee ownership uh, schemes, uh, indeed, um, we see that there has been a lot of interest uh, in uh, uh, this kind of uh, tools uh, that can help, let's say, uh, create a more confidence, more um, uh, experience with capital markets uh, by uh, employees that mm, not normally maybe they would not have such uh, experience and that can basically help them also then to uh, get more acquainted to how to invest and to uh, basically participate more in capital markets. So we saw it uh, indeed in, the, uh, in uh, uh, the report of the next CMU group. We saw that the high level forum also talked about them and in the previous mandate actually the commission has also looked into it. Um, so uh, we think it's something that uh, is promising that we look into. Um, it's not clear maybe 100% to us yet what could be the regulatory implications for it. So to what extent this is something that can be promoted, for example, by looking at best practices, how these schemes are implemented in member states, or whether there are some legislative adjustments uh, that would need to be made or new proposals that would need to be made. But uh, indeed, because this has been something that uh, many uh, have uh, promoted, we, we want to look at it and we will see how we can take up this action in the CMU action plan. On the fees, uh, indeed, uh, again, this is something that we uh, have already started uh, in the uh, previous action plan, we asked the European supervisory authorities to carry out an assessment of and compare the costs and fees of different uh, investments products. Um, this is also very much linked to the issue of disclosures, of course, uh, which again features prominently in, in all the reports, including the one that uh, uh, is being presented today. Um, and we, uh, we think there is a merit in uh, looking uh, uh, with fresh eyes at the different disclosures to investors across pieces of legislation, across uh, PREPS, MIFID, uh, the Insurance Distribution Directive, and so on. Uh, and we need to do it by putting ourselves from the perspectives of the saver of the investor not from the perspective of who has to disclose but from the perspective of the recipients of the disclosures that's why we are also launching a, a very um, a comprehensive study uh, looking at all these disclosures across legislation with the idea that uh, later on uh, in the mandate uh, we um, we can make, make some targeted adjustments or some changes to legislation to improve the disclosure. And on this, I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, the parliament will be very much uh, uh, working closely with us because we know that for the parliament, uh, this issue of transparency to investors, especially on costs to investing uh, is, very, uh, is very important. Um, so I, I will maybe stop here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Andrea. Stefano, you want to say a final word on that? Before yeah, yeah um, employee ownership. Um, just what can you hear me because I, I have a background? Okay, okay. Um, well, the, the, as you may know, the, the first objective um, for, for Renew is an inclusive CMU for retail investors and, and for SMEs and entrepreneurs. So in our view, we should help citizens when they want to invest, when they want to participate directly in financing the economic recovery. So this could definitely be done through employee ownership schemes um, that we, we, we hardly want to develop, of course, across Europe.
Okay, thank you very much. Final word of uh, thank you to Stefan. Um, probably Stefan was going to close before I pass uh, thank the different speakers. Stefan? Well, uh, the final words, there would be many, uh, many words to, to say. Uh, what, what I'm really happy uh, about is uh, to see that, uh, as, as I said already, there is a, a strong uh, consensus already on the fact that we need to move forward, um, that we are getting into a new phase of uh, the development of capital markets in, uh, in Europe. Uh, we had a phase of strong regulation or re-regulation um, in, in, uh, after the uh, 2008 crisis. We now need to move to a phase of development, reasoned development, um, but it's uh, uh, crucial, it's critical for the financing of uh, our economies, for the recovery after the current crisis, and, and to face uh, and to answer uh, the states that we, we are currently uh, uh, facing. So that's really, uh, that's really uh, important and that would be my, my last word. I would like still to, uh, to thank uh, well, you, Carol, and, uh, and your teams again for uh, your, uh, your support and uh, uh, all the, the, uh, the data and ideas that you brought uh, into, uh, into the report. And I would like to thank, obviously, uh, the speakers, but you, you will do that uh, uh, also and better than me, I'm, I'm sure. And I would like last to thank uh, the permanent staff of, uh, of AMAFI for, for the work uh, done. And especially, again, I mentioned uh, uh, our colleague uh, Arnaud Ehar, who did a great job uh, in, uh, in uh, drafting that, uh, that report for, and writing that report for AMAFI. Thank you all. So thank you on my behalf. Thank you, uh, Stefan. Thank you, Fabrice. Thank you, Stefani, Andrea. So as I said, the report is available on AMAFI's uh, website. Let me also thank my colleague Apostolos Tomadakis, who did a lot of work on this report. Also Beatrice, who hosted, moderated the seminar technically. And again, all of you participants for participating. We had 84 participants in the beginning. We now have 61. So thank you for staying on for the questions and for your participation. And I hope we can meet again in another context. Thank you very Carol, much. Carol, can I just, can I just uh, say um, a, a formula as a last word? Uh, first, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting time. And maybe a formula beyond tools and beyond rules, we need enthusiasm uh, from the citizens for the CMU project and for the young generation. So let's uh, have uh, now a CMU spirit. That's certainly well taken. Stefani, you have made that message very well. Uh, I think also uh, Fabrice has addressed this in uh, his report. We also addressed this in the past, the importance to raise the awareness with citizens of what is CMU about and uh, that it concerns all of them. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.